Okay. Good morning. <laughs> it must be Monday. What I would like to do today, here's, here's a brief summary I would like to cover in today's session, is we want to wrap up the financial modeling work that we did last session. And what I want to point out to you is this formula for the future value in terms of compound growth is very important for you to remember. And this is, uh, let me just ask you a question. What's P stand for? What's it mean? The principal or also called the present value or the initial value of an investment. A is the future value as time passes. This is a function, A is a function of time, time in years, typically for this model. Very important for you to remember this. How many of you remember it? How many don't yet, don't know it yet? Okay, got to get it in your brain. It's like your phone number. Make sure you know it, okay? Somebody else now, tell me what R is. What? Well, something a little more descriptive than just rate. Interest rate. Interest rate, but <laughs> rate of change. annual percentage rate. Annual percentage rate. That's the rate of return for the investment over the course of a year, okay? If there was no compounding. Now, somebody else who hasn't spoken up yet, tell me what N is. <laughs> number of times it's multiplied the, the year. Number of times, as Jerome said, the number of times you're getting the interest given to you per year. So this is the number of compoundings per year. So, and then T represents what? Time in years. In years. Time in years. So if you look up here at this formula, and you're starting to develop some ability to look at a formula and actually have a sense of what it's all about. And a lot of you had some real trouble at the beginning of the term, even with basic algebra things, of trying to make that connection between looking at a formula and understanding its behavior, its characteristics, and that kind of stuff. So you folks have actually come a long way since then. Now, up here in the exponent, the product of n and t, that means the number of compoundings per year times the number of years. So that's the total number of compoundings that are going to occur to reach a point sometime in the future, like two and a half years, five years, 10 years, something like that, times the number of compoundings. That's the total number of compoundings. For instance, if you bought a house, now this is more of an investment model here. But if you bought a house where you took out a loan and you're paying that loan off, like a, say a 15-year fixed mortgage, you're making monthly payments 15 years times 12 would be the exponent in there. 15 times 12. That is a lot of payments to pay off that loan for the house. Mm -hmm. Is there a different model? Oh, yeah. For yeah. loans? Okay. Yeah, for loans, yeah. This is more of an investment model here, and we would use this for simple compounding kinds of things, okay? And it's not much more, there's no more sophisticated math to understand like a mortgage or a car loan, that kind of a thing, than really understanding this. You folks are capable of it, we're just not teaching it as part of this course. You can look in just about any algebra book though and find those kind of formulas and, and uh, be able to understand them. Okay, so that was compounding. Now. In the last session, we did, we did some problems, and we left off a problem where I think we had monthly compounding, and I want to pick up and finish that problem off today. And then we'll do some other things. I also, in the last session, talked about this model, PERT, P-E to the R-T, is equal to the future value. And so this is for what type of situation? Somebody else who hadn't spoken yet. What are we going to use this one for? It's, it is exponent. All of these are exponential growth. Both of these are exponential growth. But this is for Continu continuous compounding. The compounding is occurring continuously. And we went through a little exercise in the last session to illustrate why. Okay. How this turns into that situation. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up that financial model with an example that we didn't quite finish on the last session. 
And then what we want to we'll spend the rest of the time today talking about, there's no real new mathematics here in these two. This is called growth. There's another section in our book dealing with growth models. This could be population growth oftentimes, or as we spoke of previously, uh, bacteria colony growth, that type of thing. It's called uninhibited growth. There's nothing interfering with the growth occurring. And you should be good enough to be able to look at this formula and, and see the y-intercept is up at a naught. That's your y-intercept. And then it's going to grow with a base e exponential raised to the exponent of k, <coughs> which is the growth rate times time. Notice in the book, in a textbook, the decay model is written exactly the same way. I usually don't do it this way. I usually put a negative up here with the exponent because it's real clear to me and it's clear to you as well. If you have a negative exponent, you're going to have a decay model as long as the base is bigger than 1. And E, you know, is about what? 2.718 approximately. Try to keep that in your head as well. So notice what we have here in this model. Both models are identical in the book, except for the growth model has a k value up here, which is greater than 0, positive. And on the decay model here, the k is less than 0, <coughs> negative. So this is going to be a decaying exponential. And then we'll talk a little bit, if we have time, at the end of class about a logistics model. At least give you the sense of the curvature, the kind of behavior that occurs on this thing, the shape of the curve, and be able to understand why that's a, uh, quite useful as well. So the problem we left off with in the last session, I'd like to begin there, was the following. I believe we had an $800 investment. We had $800. No, actually, I think that was actually a future value at three and a half years. Right? So A at three and a half years was equal to $800. Remember, we wanted to have this much money in the future. And our interest rate, our annual percentage rate, called the APR, happens to be 7%, which we know is 0 .00, 0 0.07 as a decimal. And the time was locked in at three and a half years. OK, without going through all of that work, we ended up with the present value. By dropping these into the compound interest formula, we ended up with the 800 being equal to the present value, or the initial value, times 1 plus 0.07 divided by 12. Oh, we're doing also, I believe, monthly compounding here. So we have to have n equal to 12 times per year. And this is raised to the exponent then of 12 times 3 and a half. OK. When we solved this for p, in other words, this arithmetic over here is just a number, and we divide both sides by that number and solve for p, we ended up with a p-value of 626.62. So this much money must be invested so that in three and a half years, we end up with $800. And here's what we also had. This is the amount of money in the future versus time and years. And so we ended up here, we, we actually had a point out here where this was 800 at three and a half years. So that was the point we were given. And we knew the interest rate. So what we did essentially is we built a model, given this data point, we built a model that figured out what this initial value was, which turned out to be 626.62 <coughs> at time zero. So that in three and a half years, you end up with the 800. 
So that was the problem we tackled on the, during the last session. Now the question is, this model continues to grow then. And so what I'd be interested in is how much time would it take for this amount of money, the original amount, to double? To double. So this is going to be the doubling time. And I'm going to label that T sub D. And so what's going to happen is we want to end up up here where we are at a height here a height of doubling this value, doubling the initial value. Okay. So how would we do the math? How would we do the math to figure that out? We want to figure out this doubling time, this height right here, this amount of money. Wouldn't you use, instead of putting 3.5 in for T, you'd just put T there? Doesn't this have to turn in to be $1,253 and 24 cents? Yeah. So we're trying to get up to that level. And as Melissa said, would you, would you just suggest um, you pass that back to formula, you? formula, putting just T instead of 3.5 and solving for T. Okay. 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 Here, tell you what, let me just put it up here. I think I think what you folks are saying is correct. We're looking for the future value. Now, here's our model. What we're trying to do is double the initial amount here. So we want this value to be this. 1253.24, and we started out with 626 after we did this initial problem, first problem, 62. And then we had numbers going in here, 1 plus 0.07 divided by 12 raised to the 12. And then now, look at my exponent up here. What do I need to put for T? Look at the picture here. I'm letting my future value be 1253.24, initial value this, everything's all numbers, so what needs to go up in that exponent right up there? T. T, D, G. T sub D. T, T with a subscript D for the doubling time. Okay. Now look at the math. Everything is numbers here except that T sub D. What kind of an equation is this? Exponential. Why is it called an exponential equation? Because it has an unknown in the exponent. Very good, because it has an unknown in the exponent, as we said about a thousand times this term, right? So what we have to do is just simply isolate this mess, isolate this, so that that T sub D is sitting there as an exponent on this base. And what happens if I start by dividing both sides by 626, 62? We get two. Yeah, we're going to end up with two here, aren't we? Okay. So we're just going to end up with two equals this thing with the exponent. Right? And would it matter if this problem had been uh, $800 in the future, three and a half years, and we did this stuff and ended up with these numbers, or could it have been any numbers? Any. Could have been any numbers, couldn't it? So what we're, the kind of problem we're tackling here is using the compound interest formula for a general situation where this future value here is twice the initial value. So you're always going to end up with a 2 right here if you're doing a doubling time problem times this base. Okay. Now, what I want to do is punch up, and we did this the other day, and actually it's on your note, this paper that uh, Jerome lent me a moment ago. We punched this number up in the last class session. Look at your note there, Jerome, your notes from class. This number we punched up, and it was 1.07, what? It's down there near the bottom of your paper. 1.2767. 1.07. 2767. 2767 raised to the 
T sub D. Sorry, erase the zero and the seven after the period. No, no, you wrote it down wrong. Okay. One point. Oh, there it is. One point zero seven two three. Two three. Yeah. Round. That's what I got just yeah. now. Zero seven two three. Or okay. two two nine zero zero. Eight, okay. Nine. okay. If you're watching the DVD <laughs> and you've got your calculator, just punch this thing out up, including that twelve, and you should get this number. <laughs> And then that exponent, T sub D, is still there. Okay. This thing, when you divide by the initial amount, you end up with 2. So what I'm going to do is let's go, uh, let's come down here on the board. Sorry for these small boards like this. But what we end up having is a simple exponential situation. And this is equal to 2. Now, you need to use what to solve these things? Logs. Logarithms, as we've been studying over and over again. So what we do now <coughs> is take the logarithm, and you can use whichever button, whichever base log you happen to use off your calculator. Base what or what? You have two of them. Log, base 10 or E. Base 10 or E, e right? So if you use either one of those, you, you'll get this. Why don't we use base E just for the fun of it? So if we take the natural log of both sides, and you've been doing this now for over a week, hopefully. Over a week, and that's a long time. Yeah. And then we now have the natural log of both sides of the equation we've taken. We've applied to both sides of the equation. And the exponent now by the power rule pops out in front. And so the T sub D comes out in front. And then we're going to move the natural log of 1.0723, divide both sides by it. <coughs> and it's going to go end up over through division underneath the natural log of 2. So what I want to write down for just a second is that. Now, what I'd like you all to do is to punch the natural log of 2 on your calculator. Six nine three one approximately, and then the natural log of one point oh seven should be a number very close to. Think about it. The natural log of one is the exponent of e that gives you a number very close to one. So that number has to be pretty small, doesn't it? What you get? Point zero six seven. Uh, one more. Uh, seven. Okay, and then finally, the division of the two is going to give us our doubling time. Ten point two three eight. Okay, about ten point two three, and this model. Remember, look back at the original problem. The modeling in time is in years, so this indicates that the investment, this initial $626 investment, or any investment, any investment compounded monthly at 7% annual percentage rate, will any investment will double in 10.23 years. Ten point two three years. Now, I mentioned something a couple weeks ago in class when we first started talking about logarithms called the rule of 70 that real estate people and investment folks use all the time. What it is, is it's a rough estimate for doubling time, and it is 70 divided by the annual percentage rate. Think about it. If you took this investment at 7%, and you take 70 divided by 7, you get 10. While property values were growing in the last few decades, 
realtors were using this all the time to try to get you to buy a house from them. Okay? They would say, you can buy this place for this much money and in about 10 years, if, if, if the rate of return was about 7% 7, 7 on the growth of the investment, that you're going to double your money in about 10 years on that investment. And oftentimes, homes were growing at a much ra more rapid rate, like, say, 20% in per certain parts of the country. So if you'd bought a place for a uh, growth rate occurring at 20%, folks, 70 divided by 20 is three and, a half. three and a half. You would double your investment in three and a half years. Turn around, sell it. A lot of people did that, and then a lot of people got in trouble also, once that bubble burst. Okay, so remember this rule. It's a good rough estimate. Look at that. We're only about a quarter year off. We're only about a quarter year off by just using that rule of thumb. And do you, do you see why it's called the rule of 70? That's the reason I wanted you to punch this natural log of 2, 0.69. Okay, so that's, that's the idea that you'll find useful. Um, in the future. Okay, any questions about that? It's very practical material here in, a, in one quick example and then some generalization about doubling time. Okay, again, the process was you, you, you just start playing with it and you see where it gets you and notice that we ended up with an exponential equation in here and then your technique that you need to remember when you see an exponential equation is to isolate the exponential, which is what we did, this thing involving the exponent. We isolated it, and then we applied logarithms because that power rule is very handy in being able to solve for the unknown exponent. Questions? Okay. Don't miss class unless you're sick, okay? Last, last session, there were a bunch of people that weren't here. I think that was because we'd finished the midterm and felt like taking a day off for some reason. Okay. Don't miss class, please. Okay. There's no new territory for us to cover, really, with these next two models now. We're going to now do these growth models and decay models. And the mathematics is exactly the same as what we've been doing, except we're dealing with a base E exponential. So what I'd like to do is to take a growth problem right out of the textbook. And then we'll tackle a decay one as well. And what I'm going to do is magnify this to the point where you can see this. I don't think I can get the one I wanted on there. I'm going to have to grab another one here so it won't show up. I'm going to help you with one of your homework problems here once I get this thing so it'll show up on the DVD. Oh, one other comment. We're trying to get this, these materials available on the Internet. And those files are too large. There's the problem for like a whole class session with the kind of resolution we need to be able to see the board and to see this writing type of a thing. And so what we're trying to do is to segment each class session into little 10-minute chunks. Then it'll be downloadable, more easily downloadable to your computers. So for the time being, just come over and check out the DVDs at the Resource Center if you need them. Yes. Melissa? Will it be up by next term? Like I'm hoping so, term? yes. Yeah, and then we'll be continuing. I'll be teaching this course here in the studio again next term, trigonometry next term, uh, continuing on so that we can get this material recorded and then it can be used as a resource for students that wish to watch these things. Uh, back in the studio, is this high enough resolution on that image? Okay, good. So here's the question, population. Southern city following exponential laws. N's the population of the city, T's the time in years, express N as a function of T. Well, it's up here on the other board, right? Now, they're talking about, this is number seven, and they're saying that, and for those using this particular textbook, page 332, 
Southern city population follows exponential growth. So what I oftentimes do is I first of all try to get a sense of it graphically. So they're <coughs> telling us that the population is called N and time is in years and it's following exponential growth. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a population that's going to look like this, growing exponentially. And so what we need is to nail down some initial value here. And so oftentimes we use a subscript, little zero, oftentimes called naught. I mentioned that before. And then that's the behavior. That's the behavior. So that's the first step. If the population doubled in size over an 18-month period, that's rapid, <laughs> year and a half and the current population is 10,000, what will be the population two years from now? Now, we're going to do more than just answer that question. Okay? So, what they're telling us in this is that the population doubled in size over an 18 year, over 18 month period, and the current population is 10,000. So, we're going to use an initial population of 10,000, Then we're going to, and it doubles, so the population grows in 18 months. So this is going to be, if our model is in years, then 18 months is equivalent to what? Excuse me? One and a half, right? In one and a half years, that's 18 months. Make sure you get your units correct. And that population up here on my graph is now twice what it initially was. So at one and a half years, the population is twice what it started at. So at 1.5 years, the population is twice the initial amount, or 20,000. Okay, and then the question that's being asked is what is the population at two years? This is a classic algebra textbook problem. We do not have enough information to completely do the problem in one step. We don't have enough information. Here's why. If we write down what the model says, n equals 10,000 e to the kt, there's the model. One piece of information tells us that the population doubles in 18 months. So n at 1.5 is 20,000. And that's equal to 10,000 e to the k times 1.5. The question, however, being asked is what's the population at two years? What's the population at two years? And this, to answer this question, we need to figure out what k is, because here's the model. Here's the problem we're trying to actually end up with, right here. And if you take the time to read these questions several times, usually, to understand them, in math and science and business, that's what you've got to do if you've got some situ it in interesting uh, situation, you have to take several readings of it to understand it, you write down the given information, try to get a sense of it graphically, and then write down what you can. And then look at it and think about it. So as you notice, this problem is not solvable because we don't know this value and we don't know the k. We have two unknowns sitting in this equation. 
So you come back to this other piece of information and we feel much better because there's only one unknown here. <laughs> okay, right. Now watch the similarity to this problem solving for the K to the problem we just talked about a couple minutes ago. We isolate the exponential. Isolate the exponential. And so we have e to the 1.5k is equal to what? 20,000. 20,000 divided by 10,000? Two. 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 <laughs> okay, very good. Probably use base e x logarithms, right? Natural logarithms. So you take the natural log of both sides. And there's that natural log of 2 showing up again. If you're a good listener, natural log of 2 you'll keep in the back of your brain. 0.69. Okay? The rule, they call it the rule of 70. Probably ought to call it the rule of 69. Trouble is, 69 is not as easily divisible <laughs> as 70 is. Okay. So, power rule 1.5 pops out in front with the K by the power rule. Natural log of E is equal to our natural log of 2. Natural log of E, max. Natural log of E. One. Good. Sound a little hesitant on that, okay? It's one, right? It's the exponent of E that gives you E as value as one. So K then is going to be equal to the natural log of two divided by 1.5. Oftentimes textbooks will actually write this down and treat it as a formula. The growth rate is equal to the natural log of 2 over the doubling time. You can see that in textbooks frequently. The natural log of 2 divided by the doubling time. Is what? Is the growth rate. OK. If you punch this on a calculator, what do you pick up? What did you get, Jerome? Uh, point. Four six two zero nine eight one two zero four. Point four six two. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to round off to point four six. Okay. Normally, I, I, normally I like to write four decimal places, and oftentimes store it in the calculator's memory, mm -hmm. if I need to use that number later, which we will, won't we? Yeah, your numbers come out a little bit different yeah. if you don't use the whole thing. Yeah. So I would suggest you probably carry four decimal places or use the memory cells of your calculator through the store key. Notice, this is the growth rate, folks. Does it make sense to you that if, a, if this population doubles in one and a half years, that that is very rapid growth? And what's that percentage? 46 percent growth rate. After one year, it's half again as much. And after less than two years, it's doubled. Okay, important concepts here. Okay, now you then take that value, and here's the accuracy. Notice the difference between the exact equal sign here for this versus the approximate equal sign for that decimal. So now we can come back over here now using that growth rate value, and we can write down what this population is going to be in two years. And so we can put that into our exponent. And if I'm real careful with it, I can take and tuck it in up here, natural log of 2 over my 1.5, and multiply that times 2. And then if you punch this on your calculator, we'll get an approximate value for the population in two years. We know that it doubled in one and a half years to 20,000, and so in two years, right here, in two years, we're going to see what population value? 25,198. 25,000, 
classic textbook example. If you were a city planner, or let's say you were the technical person advising the city manager and the city council, maybe in charge of the utilities, because you have to deal with the population growth for hookups for electricity and water, those kind of things, okay? What would you come back, if you, if you were asked to do this work, what would you come back and tell the city council? For big numbers of people. Are, are you gonna Are you gonna <laughs> tell them twenty five thousand one hundred ninety eight? No. Right. You're gonna You're gonna round this off roughly. You're gonna say we're expecting probably about twenty five thousand people or so in the community, because there's different fluctuations obviously that are gonna occur. This is not gonna be precise. So you're making estimates. You're using mathematics to make an estimate. I would fire the technical person if they walked in and told me that there were 25,198 people two years from now in this community. Because I go and hold it. They don't have a clue about the fact that there's other forces that yeah. come into play. Okay? I can see in the future. Right. Okay. So try to be reasonable with those kind of estimates. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions about the whole thing? Confusion anywhere, Jennifer? Why can't you just take the 18 months and go to a 0.5 system and multiply out 1,000 for growth for every? Oh. Do you understand what I'm saying there? <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, back several sessions ago, when I first started talking about exponentials, I used a base two. And we could have done that with this problem. Notice that this thing has this, here, this number right here, e to the k, e to the k is e to the 0.46, right? You see that, e to the k? I'm looking, at, I'm looking down here at the work we did. e to the k is a e to the 0.46 approximately. If you punch that on your calculator, what do you get? One point five eight approximately. Mm -hmm. So that actually could be your model. That could be the base of your model. And that would be a model like <coughs> ten thousand one point five eight to the T, where T is in years. This might be confusing, but what I'd like you to do is to take 1.58 now and raise it to the 1.5 power. 1.986. 1.986. You have a sense of what's going on here? If I raise that to the 1.5, we get a value of and I notice I rounded this off to two decimal places here, too, this base. Notice that number. That's the doubling. Doubling, two. Yeah. See? The, it doubled, the population doubled in one and a half years. So if I take that base and force that to be the, use that exponent of 1.5 years, I get a base now of two there. I get a value of two. So anyway, don't worry about that. Just kind of mixing numbers together. You, base E models is the important thing for you to remember here. P, E to the R, T, or in this case, we're using the symbol N, N, E to the K, T. Okay, let's do a decay model. Is there going to be any difference in the mathematics? No. There's a negative sign. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's no difference in the mathematics. All that's going to happen using the model the way the textbook has it is that exponent k is going to turn out to be negative. So we can grab, 
we could grab a population decay model out of the book. Let's try, how about number 10 over here, if I can find that. There it is. Radioactive potassium. Radioactive decay number 10. So, same modeling, n as a function of time, and this time it's coming down, it's decaying. Now, what we're going to do is we have a model, these markers are running low. We have a model that says it's an initial amount e to the kt, and this time, this exponent is going to be negative. This k right here is going to turn out to be a negative value for it to be a decay model. The problem says that we're dealing with radioactive potassium with a half-life of 1.3 billion years. 10 grams of it are present now. How much will be present in 100 years? In 1,000 years. Think about that, folks. It said that the half-life is 1.3 billion years. And you're starting out with 10 grams of this stuff. If you're starting out with 10 grams of that stuff, what kind of an answer are you going to expect in 100 years? Almost two. I'd say, I'd say it's really the small. same amount, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Very, very slight degradation. Okay. In a thousand years? A little less. Probably, eight probably eight. insignificantly <laughs> less. Okay. So it's going to be hanging right there near, right there near um, that 10 grams for a long, long time. Okay. Because the half life is so long. Okay. So we're starting out with this initial amount of 10 grams, and the half-life is, what they, how many billion? 1.3 billion. 1.3 billion, mm -hmm. and I talked about powers of 10 previously with you. A million is 10 to the sixth. A thousand <coughs> million is a billion. 10 to the ninth. 10 to the ninth. A thousand million. 10 to the ninth. So that's the half-life. So the modeling, you should, for a few problems, you should actually go through all the algebra, including solving that little exponential equation like I just did with you. After you've practiced a few problems stepping through it, like this problem is asking you to do to find the decay rate, then you could go ahead and use the formula. And that formula for that decay rate is going to be what? What did I just do with you? Natural log of 2 divided by the doubling time or the half-life time. Okay. So if I just go ahead and lay that in there, natural log of 2 divided by 1.3 times 10 to the ninth. What do you get? Actually, I think I have some kind of a bug in the works here. Because that's not going to come out negative. Okay, so I better do the math. Better do the math. So here we well, go. Well, that should be negative K, shouldn't it? 
Well, the textbook was wanting us to use this kind of model. Oh, I know what the problem is. I better do the math because I screwed up by doing this. Let me just tell you so I can just fix the notes here. If it's a decay model, <coughs> this is negative, and I'll show you why right now. Now, when you punch this on your calculator, negative natural log of 2 over the 1.3 times 10 to the ninth, what do you get for an answer? You're going to get a very, very tiny number in scientific notation. Let's do it quickly. We're getting short on time. Excuse me? Sorry? There's an E. There's a capital E sitting there. Read it to me. Read. So 5.3 times E or 10 to the negative 10. 5.3 times 10 to the negative 10. 10. And it should be negative. Right? Because you have a negative in front of the natural log. Okay. Let me show you why that result comes out. And it's a very tiny number. That's a decay rate, very slow decay rate as expected because it takes a huge amount of time for this thing to decay to half of its original radioactivity. Here's the math. Okay, forget the calculator now. You, you need to learn how to read those numbers though. <laughs> okay, so here's the math. If we're dropping down to half what we started with, then we're going to end up with half of the original amount was equal to the starting amount e to the k and there is a they told us that time was 1.3 times 10 to the ninth years necessary there and look at this both sides the original amount disappears. We're now left with not a two over here, folks, but a half. That's the reason we're going to turn out with a negative. Because now when you take the logarithm of both sides and apply the power rule, we get 1.3 times 10 to the ninth natural log of E being 1 times K. And don't forget your K in here. Sorry about that. And that's equal to the natural log of 1 half. The natural log of 1 half is the natural log of 1 minus the natural log of 2. And we're just about out of time here. Look at this. Natural log of 1 is what? Zero. 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 Natural log of 1 is 0. And so here's your negative natural log of 2. So this equation right here, solving for k, it brings you right to this. So when you're doing decay modeling and closing, when you're doing decay modeling and closing, the rule for the decay rate is the negative natural log of 2 over the half lifetime for the calculation, or just do the algebra to solve for it. I did not get to the logistics model today. What we'll do is we'll give you a brief, some brief comments in the next class session on that. And that will wrap it up for today for the DVD. And I want to I let you know a couple quick things here just about for our class.